This week on the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. Create your routine, find your flow, mm-hmm. whatever it is that gets you in the chair to write, you know, 10 pages, 2000 words, whatever your goal is for the day, find that sort of uh, those little things that give you a push towards doing that every day. Welcome to the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. News, interviews, and writing tips for people who are serious about having a writing career and want some practical knowledge to help them achieve it. Your host is the nationally best-selling author of more than 50 books, William Bernhardt. Hello, sneakers, and welcome back to the podcast. Hey, before I say another word, let me give you an update on that graph we showed on the last podcast the one about spiking hardcover sales that showed a steep mid-year plummet. I didn't know what that was about. But fortunately, my brilliant sound engineer, Jesse Ulrich, does. Jesse, can you please explain that graph? Yes. So props to my wife for explaining this to me, because apparently Etsy does a similar thing where this report was done in the month of July. And so the July numbers had not come out. And so that's why it looks like there's a dramatic drop in month seven. So but it hasn't. It's just not. Yes. Gone yes. The, the numbers have not been added. Normally, they would just n- not show that downline and just leave it there. But I guess that is a, uh, a thing people who make these type of graphs do now. So that is why it looks like the numbers dropped dramatically. They didn't. The numbers just haven't been reported yet. Nope. Hardcover sales are still astounding. Everyone. Thank you. Hey, full full feature service here. We, we got it all. And we are only about two weeks away from WriterCon, and you would think that this late in the game, I would not be adding more features, but I am. Just in the last two days, I've added two more publishers, another agent, and a writer to our speaking roster. If you would like to review the programming schedule for this year's conference yourself, please visit our website, which is writercon.org, W-R-I-T-E-R-C-O-N. Dot org, or you can download the official WriterCon phone app or mobile device app, I should say. Just search for WriterCon 2021, download it, costs you nothing. And once you see everything we have to offer, I think you'll realize this is where you need to be on Labor Day weekend. Remember, you can come to the conference in Oklahoma City Live, or you can stream it from home. You don't even have to watch it live, actually. The sessions will be online for a month after the conference, so you can watch it whenever you have time, all right? That's writercon.org. And if you're searching the app in the App Store, if you're in the Apple universe or Google Play, if you're in the Android universe, look for WriterCon 2021. My interview guest today is the fabulous award-winning author, R.J. Johnson who has a new book out this week called Dream Slinger, the first in an epic fantasy series. I have had the pleasure of knowing Rick for many years now. He's a fine writer and someone who knows as much about writing and this writing business as anyone. So I'm looking forward to talking to him. But first, the news. News item number one, Hachette is buying Workman Publishing for, get ready for this, $240 million. As you probably know, Hachette is one of the so-called Big Five publishers, about to be Big Four, and they're about to be bigger because they're acquiring a very large publishing company and folding them into their publishing mantle. It's a deal that is so big it will require regulatory approval, but it's expected to be received. And then Hachette's parent company, the French multinational corporation, Lagardier, apologies if I said that wrong, uh, they're expecting it to happen this fall. Just to put this in perspective for you, Workman had sales of $134 million last year, up 12% over the previous year. This is a major event in the writing business as the already 
pretty small world of traditional publishing gets even smaller. Workman is one of the largest independent, formerly independent publishers left in the United States. The, uh, Workman includes Workman Publishing and Algonquin and Artesian and Timber Press and a bunch of others. They're the ones who put out a lot of things you're familiar with, like Brain Quest, the Page a Day Calendars, the B. Kleiben Cat series, the official Preppy Handbook, What to Expect When You're Expecting, that whole line of books. So the takeaway for you, Red Sneaker writers, is that your agents now will have even fewer places to sell your manuscripts if you're seeking traditional publishing. Okay, news item number two. James Patterson, the highest grossing writer in America, and Dolly Parton are publishing a book together. In March, Little Brown is going to publish Run, Rose, Run, this is a collaboration between Patterson and Parton. It's going to be in print, ebook, audio editions. The novel is apparently about a young singer with a dark secret that inspires her music, draws on Dolly Parton's experiences in country music, as you might guess. And here's the real kicker. Simultaneously with the book, Parton is going to release an album, also called Run, Rose, Run, and featuring 12 new songs she's written inspired by the novel. She says the songs are, quote, based on the characters and situations in the book, end quote. The lyrics are threaded throughout the novel. This is a very integrated package between Patterson and Parton. Patterson, of course, is a writer known for his sometimes really grisly plots, and Dolly Parton is a musician beloved, I think, throughout the country <laughs> and perhaps throughout the world, so it seems a little odd, but Patterson explained that both he and Dolly Parton consider ourselves storytellers. I don't know, Jesse, are you going to run out and read this book? I mean, I don't normally read James Patterson books or the <laughs> ones written by his cadre of ghostwriters, but this one right. I might check out. I'm also curious if he's actually going to do the writing or if it's going to be given to one of his ghostwriters. But like all Americans, I love Dolly Parton, so... I might listen to the album first, and if I like the album, then I'll read the book. One suspects that neither will have much to do with the content of the book. Probably But not. who knows? Patterson is at least honest about the fact that he uses ghostwriters and co-writers. He says he's involved in the plotting, the outlining of every book, but obviously not all the writing, since there are about six different Patterson titles coming out every month, but all following the Patterson style. Short uh, chapters and paragraphs and sentences with a little description <laughs> and it, it seems to work he just uh co-authored a shadow novel the shadow being the pulp hero from the 1930s uh, you know pulp magazines and then a radio show and it sort of he's turned it into a young adult uh science fiction novel hmm. <laughs> all right i don't even know why it's called the shadow but he seems to know how to market things right okay news item three Race-related controversies, controversies create problems for writers. If this sounds familiar, it's because we've had these kinds of stories before, but here it is again. A UK publisher and author are facing criticism for racial stereotyping in Kate Clanchy's memoir called Some Kids I Taught and What They Taught Me, which is about her teaching experience in United Kingdom state schools. And it's not a new book, but now she's facing criticism on Twitter and Goodreads for her descriptions of minority ethnic children and autistic children. Uh, she's won some awards since the book came out, but now is being accused of racial stereotyping. Apparently, in the book, she describes students as being, quote, so Afghan or having a, quote, African voice or a, quote, Jewish nose. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to jump in or should we just let it slide? L I mean, listen, I don't know why Jewish nose is them is easier to write than long nose. It's one more letter. You could just say long nose. Yeah. And, and, and to, to make it worse, some people have jumped to her defense and now they're being harassed on social media. We're told that Clancy is working on a rewrite. In a very closely related story, the Romance Writers of America are now facing scorn 
and have actually rescinded one of their Vivian Awards. Now, some of you may remember the story we covered about the Reader Awards, which got into such controversy that they just scrapped it and replaced it with the new awards, which they call the Vivian Awards. And already in their first year, they've got their first scandal. They granted a Vivian Award to At Love's Command by Karen Wittemeyer in a category for romance. Romance is featuring religious or spiritual elements, but they rescinded the award. I mean, they've already given it out, and then they took it back due to complaints about the book's depictions of indigenous people and for romanticizing the tragedy of the Wounded Knee Massacre. In the book, the, the romantic love interest, who is an officer in the 7th Cavalry, acknowledges that he participated in the massacre, but there remains an implication that the Lakota people were somehow somewhat responsible for what happened. This book came out from a Christian publisher, Bethany House. Well, you may wonder why I featured this story, because we've certainly seen these kinds of controversies before. And I guess I just want to remind you, Red Sneaker writers, that this is not over and you don't want the next instance of it to be you. You cannot be too careful. Whether you think these complaints are justified or not, you do not need a Twitter storm in your life. It will spoil your book launch, spoil your career, and definitely spoil your book sales. So be careful when addressing issues of race. Consider getting a sensitivity read, you know, input from members of the group you're writing about. If indeed you need to tread in such delicate waters at all. All right, that's the end of the news. Time for the interview. My interview today is with the fabulous R.J. Johnson, whose new novel, Dream Slinger, just launched two days ago on Tuesday. R.J., thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I really can't tell you how what a blast it is to do this kind of thing. This is awesome. Uh, good Dream to have cover. you back. Good to have you back. Hey, okay, traditional first question. If you could offer a writer one nugget of wisdom, one great piece of advice, what would it be? I, I think my go-to has always been, you know, create your routine, find your flow. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that gets you in the chair to write, you know, 10 pages, 2,000 words, whatever your goal is for the day, find that sort of... Uh, those little things that give you a push towards doing that every day, whether that's setting an alarm on your watch, just say, you know, okay, 4 p.m. is writing time. That's when I have to excuse myself and go do this thing or getting up an hour early. You know, it's just, it's just like anything else is what I've always said is it's like going to the gym and the more often you do it, the more you even kind of crave it. You, you want to do it every day. You get stronger, you get better at it. So that's kind of my advice. I've been to the gym. I've never craved it. I guess <laughs> that means clearly neither have I, obviously. But you know, it's still a good idea. You know, you, you're seeking out those endorphins, those, yeah. those kind of things that make you feel good for having done something the previous day. Hey, I am well. I do feel better. I, I write every day, but when I really do a good job and get something done, you feel better all day long, don't you? Mm -hmm. Even if you're not writing. Absolutely. I got to say, I'm impressed by your backdrop with the posters. I mean, I've got my little, you know, book cover poised over my shoulder, but you got these big posters. That's impressive. I, you know, I just, I always wanted to see my book covers as posters. And mm -hmm. when I got them designed, I just took it on down to Staples and had them print out a big old thing. I mean, it's only for me. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'm really the only person that sees them. So it's not like it's like on display. <laughs> well, now, every, no. now we all are. So right, yeah. very impressed. Yeah. Let me remind everyone while I'm thinking about it, because sometimes I forget, those of you who are watching this interview live, I got the chat box open. So feel free to toss questions to... Uh, RJ, and I will make sure that they get asked, okay? Uh, you're coming to WriterCon this year, right? I am. I'm looking forward to it. I think this will be my third time that yeah, I've gone fantastic. to WriterCon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's always a good time. You meet a lot of great people. The networking there is is second to none, I found. And the master classes especially, um, those really helped me. Last year, not last year. It wouldn't have been last year, obviously. Um, but the last time I went, I took a master class um, about podcasting that really helped me out. 
Really? And and yeah. now here we are doing it, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that is cool. Give everybody a, a flash forward. What are you going to be speaking about at the conference? Well, I thought I'd, I'd take my experience because what I do normally is a day job. I'm actually the right. digital content manager for one of the big talk radio stations out here in, L- in L.A. So my job is just basically maintaining, you know, the station's Facebook pages, Instagram, the website, all that stuff. So I thought I'd, I'd use that experience and talk about how uh, people can build up a, a good readership following in their online social circles, uh, as well as how important newsletters have become. Because oh, believe it or not, newsletters are still incredibly valuable for people. Right. E-newsletters, you mean, E-newsletters. right? Yeah, exactly. I could not overemphasize how important that is. I mean, uh, the social media and whatnot, some writers, it may not be their favorite thing to do, but they're well, also I, the I, first ones to complain when their books don't sell, right? So you, you got to do it. I feel like a lot of people get frustrated, with, especially when they first log on and they and they put their stuff out there. And sometimes people have this expectation that they're immediately going to go viral or, you know, something they said will, will catch into the zeitgeist uh, <laughs> of whatever is happening in the moment. And that's how they'll all of a sudden get 50,000 followers. And that's really not the case. It's I mean, it's, it can happen. I mean, you can be the next, you know, viral moment, which is not right. always good. But you the best way to do it is just through a consistent daily posting of interesting content. I mean, and that's really what it comes down to. It's pretty unpredictable too. This doesn't have to do with writing, but I got to share this last night. My son posted a video of him. This is Ralph feeding a squirrel. I mean, it's a good video, but (laughs) his channel is squirrels of OU. He does this a lot, but last night he (laughs) did this great video of him feeding this. When he woke up this morning, 30,000 views, all time record for him. And that's what's, you know, it's uh, that's a perfect example of the way you can actually go viral just like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like it's a niche channel with an interesting kind of like hook to it. And then all he has to do is just find that one good video. And then all of a sudden, everybody is sharing it with everybody. And that's what I talk about when you when I talk about consistent content, because it wasn't that first squirrel video I'm betting that went viral or did. No, not at all. It was probably the 10th, 20th, 100th. I don't know how many it is, but <laughs> it's never going to be your first couple steps out into the water. It just isn't. Yeah. And why that one took up? I mean, it's good, but I, you know, who knows? But that was the why? one. It's like trying to yeah. figure out one book, why one book breaks out and it doesn't. It's sometimes hard to explain. <laughs> well, tell us about Dream Slinger. This is exciting. New book out this week. Yes. So I've been writing this one for quite a while. It's something that I'm incredibly proud of. It's it's a world that I've kind of based on my own, not my experiences, because that's, the, you know, <laughs> it's a fantasy thriller novel. So it's not like I've been meeting any aliens lately, but it's it's based on the, you know, the places around Southern California that have a kind of a special connection to me. The main center of the novel, Onyx, is kind of based off Big Bear, California, where I grew up. Uh, it's a nice little mountain town that, you know, it's that idyllic thing that you see. Joshua Tree is, of course, Joshua Tree National Park. Uh, And then plenty of other spots just around California that just serve to inspire me to write the novel as it is. Uh, And then, of course, when it comes to aliens and the rest of the plot, I don't want to give away the whole plot, really. But yeah. But just suffice it to say that I I like the idea of having something. There's something mysterious out there. Mm -hmm. Nobody has any idea what it is. Nobody, I mean, nobody can even predict what's going to happen if there were to have some kind of aliens land here somehow. But that's kind of what Dream Slinger is about, like whether or not the aliens would be a benevolent force or a chaotic force for humanity. Uh, and that's kind of the question I'm trying to answer with this series. Sounds very cool. And earlier yeah. I said that this was the first book in a series. So tell me I'm right. Am I right? <laughs> yes, yes, Absolutely. <laughs> I've got about so, five books planned on this one. Yeah. So next time I have you on, you'll have a big dream slinger poster behind you, right? That's right. Yes. <laughs> I'll have I'll have all of them ready to go. I used to have it, it's, I used to have a different uh, I can't show it to you. It's it's off. But I had a different photo posted up there of uh it sounds weird, but it is it's it's um I'm blanking on the name. Anyway, I just I'm sorry, I'm 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 stopping them killing the bit now. I'm, I apologize. So but uh, your it's books? basically what are we cats, to think it's, of? it's what this looks like. 
I used to have that photo. You can't really see it from here, uh-huh. but it's cats and cowboy hats riding horses. <laughs> And that'll be your next book. Is that what you're telling yes, us? Yes, exactly. Yeah. A Red Wall sequel. That's what I'm going to do. How did you get started writing? You mentioned there are other things you do in your life, but this is uh, not your first book. I don't know. How many is this for you? This is number five for me. Okay. Probably. Yeah. Um, How'd you get started writing? I don't know if you remember. I was this show called Space 1999. It was on oh, I Fox. I remember it. Way, yeah. Okay. So there you go. Yeah. Way back in the day, um, I think it was 1996, 97, like that, something like that. I saw like the commercial for it and something just clicked in my head where I just, I wanted to write a space adventure story. So Mm -hmm. I run upstairs, I start typing out this whole thing and I take it to my English teacher and he says, oh, this is fun. Why don't we start up an after school writing club? And so from there, we started up the club and I would contribute chapters to that work that I was doing, you know, thing. Uh, Other people joined the club and, you know, produced their poetry, their own short stories. Uh, And that's really what sparked it for me. And after that, I just kind of I always had to write. I always had Mm -hmm. to write something. Didn't matter what it was. And you have, right? Yeah, (laughs) that's as much as possible anyway. Right. Hey, we got a question uh, in the chat box. This may not be one you want because it really relates knowing, more to you know, the new stories friends. today. Right. Uh, uh, my someone is asking with all the emphasis on sensitivity. You heard the story I just did. Yes. about the, yeah. uh, Okay. Have you been encouraged to change your pronouns or any other changes? They're not talking about personal, my personal pronouns, I don't think. Uh, well, she may be, as you may well, know, there's a move to go to there instead of his or her, which makes language almost incomprehensible. But. Here's here, Well, here's what I'll say about that. I think it's important to recognize, you know, when somebody says what gender they are. I mean, whatever it is, you believe them. Um, having actual gendered language in writing is difficult. I mean, mm-hmm. but that's why they pay us the big bucks. For the mediocre bucks <laughs> or, you know, the maybe getting a coffee bucks. Yeah. But I mean, it's important. Week. To, yeah, right. Exactly. You know, you don't want to go too crazy. But I think it's really important to make sure that you're the very least trying your best to appear sensitive to that and understanding, like, what is the history behind misgendering people or misgendering pronouns or, or getting it wrong in the first place? And I think right. that's important. Well, and, and and you're in broadcasting, so it yeah. must be incredibly important. It's not. Being... You see, that's what, that's what I think is the biggest misconception about the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, all it really comes down to is just don't be a jerk. Yeah. I mean, that's really it. You just be empathetic to other people. Don't be mm-hmm. a jerk. And if you do screw up, learn from the experience, apologize. And just, you know, use that to further your education of other people. Uh, it Going viral for the wrong thing doesn't have to be career ending. I mean, it's only career ending if you let it be, I feel. Yeah, well, we just uh, did the story where uh, someone was criticized for referring to an African voice or a Jewish no- nose. Uh, I just right. had, who could write that today and not realize that's going to be offensive to someone, you know? Absolutely. And that's part of the learning process. And I think that's what the important part is, is because, I mean, you even said she's going back to rewrite and redo this stuff, right? Right. I don't know when it originally came out, because there's going to be a vast difference if it was originally written in the 70s versus like two thousand years ago. Yeah. I mean, there's a big difference between those two, you know, ideas, I feel. Mm -hmm. Um, It does seem to me that if you are a participant in the world <laughs> right? And, and are just, you know, sensitive and uh, don't say anything offensive. It shouldn't be a problem, but. Uh, you would think. Yeah, you'd think. Yeah. Uh, people in the chat box are agreeing with you. So you must have answered that one correctly. Good work. All right. There we go. <laughs> uh, and what does your writing day look like, RJ? And I, I know you're doing other things, but how do you, with everything you're juggling, how do you squeeze in the writing? Well, I start early. So I used to, I used to, my, my, when I, when I was really pounding out books and getting stuff done, I was, I was working this overnight job at, uh, in radio where I didn't have to do anything but push a button once an hour. So that was great. You know, I could spend all night writing, push my button once an hour and I'd be done. 
Um, nowadays, I have to get up at 5 a.m. So I'm working through at least two o'clock. And then after that, if I don't get a nap, I try to squeeze in about two to three hours of writing time in that. Um, and then just after that, I'm just wiped. I can't do anything else after six, seven o'clock. You know, it's time for wine and, you know, whatever show I'm binge watching. Mm-hmm. That's really okay that's really all i can do you brought it up what are you binge watching now oh gosh well i just <laughs> finished the white lotus the white lotus was just spectacular really what amazing i really really enjoyed it top to bottom I'll do um, next. there was another show that nobody has heard of and i wish that they had called kevin can f himself it stars one the, the lead actress from uh schmidt's creek and it's basically this bizarre mix between your normal sitcom you know, buffalo, you know, buffoon husband and the pretty mm-hmm. wife, and this very serious drama about the wife's life falling apart because of her buffoon husband. It's uh. this incredible mixing of genres that I've never seen before. And it's it's a really interesting way to tell a story, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Because half the show will be this kind of like everybody loves Raymond, you know, King of Queens kind of like show with a laugh track and everything. And then the other half is a super heavy trauma where you're like oh my god girl get out of that relationship what are you doing wow. and it's just it's that's another one that's really well done that i wish more people could pay attention to um and finally just one for fun because i love it so much but the the new star trek series lower decks yes the cartoon series yes can't i can't not watch binge watch that one that's a great show. Yeah, see, there you go. Jesse knows. It's a great show. It's, Jesse's it's, on board with that. Big, big Lower Decks fan over here. Yes. Just love yep. it so much. Yeah. See, this is a point of divergence in my family because the previous men- previously mentioned Ralph, the squirrel kid, won't do Lower Decks. And to me, you know, it's Star Trek. It's, yeah. <laughs> how can I not watch it? Plus, it's funny. It's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Especially if you can, if if you've been around long enough that you recognize the oh, roughly forty-seven bits of fan yeah. service in every episode. <laughs> All right, back to writing. Oh yeah, um, that that's what we talk about here. That's yeah, right. that. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of the things you've learned? So you've written five books. You got this new one out. What are some of the things you've learned along the way? Like maybe you didn't realize when you started, but uh, you know, someplace uh, at that point you discovered viewpoint which actually didn't exist in that james patterson book i just read but he seems to be selling okay just the same what have you discovered i you know what i learned i had a lot of bad habits because yeah. for the most part my my stuff has been self-taught you know mm-hmm. I, I went through my regular honors english all that stuff but i don't know if anybody really teaches you how to write a novel mm-hmm. you know in the way that you actually can write a novel i mean uh, i i learned I, I learned that no matter how many times you read over a manuscript, you can still find a typo. Oh, um, yeah. it, I've learned that you cannot do everything yourself. And as independent and as as you know, much as I want this all to be me, I don't know how to design a cover. I don't know how to, you know, I don't know how to edit it properly, get it, everything, mm-hmm. all the typos squashed. You know, it's all those things that you think you know how to do. Because, hey, I'm a smart guy. And then, you know, when the rubber meets the road, not so much. You know, that's a really good thing to say, too, because I, I, a lot of people, and that's not just people going into indie or self-publishing either, but people who think, oh, I'm not going to hire an editor. I'm, I'm a good editor. I'm a good proofreader. And they probably are. But does that mean you catch everything? No, nobody does. No, you can have 10 people read it and there's still a typo in there somewhere right right absolutely and it's and i feel like it's that kind of humility that's the thing i think i i I learned most especially over the last 10 years of just like being able to reach out to other people and say hey this is something i'm going to need a little help with would you be willing to spend some time here's a lot of money for you to spend that time on it that's the other thing too it helps I'm looking at the chat box comments. Susie is agreeing with you and what was said about sensitivity, kindness rule she offers. And I think to the last comment about getting other people to help with what you're doing as a writer, together we go further, which seems dead on to me. 
on that point, do you use beta readers? Do you send it out to people I, before you send this it? This was out actually to this was actually the first time I did that. Um, before I had never done that before because I honestly I'll feel embarrassed. Like I, a lot of times because I haven't, the other thing too, is that I haven't really developed a beta reader base. You know, I'll have people that are interested in, in my work and what I'm doing and everything like that, but I don't necessarily feel confident enough to give them the mm -hmm. crappy version of my book first, you know, the ones with all the typos and everything like that. So that is something I'm still working on. But this time around with Dream Slinger, I did get that beta reader feedback and that was the first time I've done it. And it was helpful. It was very helpful. Yeah, uh, uh, my version of that in earlier days was I'd I'd send my manuscript to people one way or another, or even before email, but with a note explaining, you know, this is an early draft, so you know, cut me some slack. But it was probably like my fourteenth draft, but whatever. Yeah, right. <laughs> Don't shame I mean, me. Just what I've learned. Wrong. <laughs> what I learned with Dream Slinger is that you have to bribe people. So what I did this time is I sent them uh, a twenty dollars Starbucks gift card. And said, "Hey, if you could get me some notes on this in the next three weeks, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. That helps. And I think I think they'll be a lot more willing to to card. read through that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's uh, that's a pretty good inducement. Do you find it harder to get yourself to sit down and do the writing, or is that getting easier? Well, it goes back to my gym metaphor. I mean, th there when I'm in the middle of a project, I will sit down and every day knock something, at least knock something out." Like I won't yeah. always get the 2000 words or the two, sorry, my, there's been a wind over here. I apologize. Yeah. I won't always get the 2000 words or the chapter that I wanted to get done, but I'll always work on something in that two or three hour space. Right. Um, but when I'm, when I don't have anything specific, I don't, I don't even look at my, I don't even turn on word. Honestly, mm -hmm. I just live it. I just let it go. Like, yeah. Yeah, see, I'm just the opposite. I've got to work today. I knew I wasn't going to get as much done as I'd like because WriterCon is only about two weeks away and my daughter is visiting, but I still got up early and made myself do at least a little something, you know? Yeah, and and, and that's what and that's what's amazing. I, I heard, so I don't remember where I heard this tale, but, uh, but somebody talked about how, you know, you lay one brick, you do another brick on top of that, eventually you're going to have a wall. Even if you do mm -hmm. one brick a day, you're going to have that wall. And that's absolutely dry. Even if you only write a few pages, say yeah. five pages a day, you've got a first draft in three months, which is a lot less time than most people spend on the first draft of their first book, <laughs> including me, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. All right. Uh, another question for the chat box. Pants... Panster, I think she means pantser. <laughs> I'm not making fun oh, of right, her. Yeah. I'm just explaining why I stumbled. Pantser or plotter? Both. I'm one of those guys that what what'll what I'll do is oh, I'll, you can't be no commit. I do, well, see, here's what happens. This is what I'll do. <laughs> so I have I have a kind of a, a long process when I'm when I'm you know plotting everything out. I'll have my my summary, my step outline, you know, all the other different outlines that you can have. And then when I start writing my characters will end up doing something that I didn't really expect. So I go and just follow what that character is doing. And that kind of leads me to a narr new narrative line. And I will refine my story and outlines from there. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of both. Like I start out with kind of like three major points. Like I know what I'm going to do with, to get myself to the beginning, middle and end. Everything else in the middle can kind of whatever happens, happens. That's kind of how I look at it. Isn't the middle the part that's most important to be mapped out, though? Because that's that's where books sag. I, you know, what I found though for me for my process is that a lot of that stuff gets fixed in the rewriting. Because my rewrites are just, I will tear it down to the bones and and then build back up again. A lot of times. Hmm. I don't know if you can see this in the chat box now. Betsy is suggesting that you should be called a planter. A pantser. <laughs> I kind of like that. And plotter like that. at the same time. Yeah. You put planter in your bio. I'm not sure everyone, Susie, thinks you're That's a plotter. Right. Sorry. Uh, a planter. God, that would baffle everyone. I'm going to try that at WriterCon <laughs> this time. And <laughs> maybe during the reception hour when the open bar is. Right. Yeah. That's, that's when it's broken. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> See if that attracts any attention. 
Well, what are you? What was? What's in the future for you? I know you're going to do more of these Dream Slinger books. Got any other plans or aspirations? Yeah, I'm, I'm working on my uh, next novel right now. Now that we've got Dream Slinger out, I'm I'm getting the second one ready to go for you, and having that one ready to go. Uh, I'm also working on the next book for this series, the Jim Mead Martian PI series. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a series that I really love. That's what I call my Star Wars, my Star Trek. Not that I would ever, I mean, you know, you always hope for some. You don't know that. I love it. (laughs) Tell us about, uh, even when you say Martian P.I., it makes me think of The Expanse, another Mm -hmm. book series that did, in fact, become a television series. Tell us about your series. The Jim Mead Martian P.I. is. (laughs) And Jesse approves of. uh, Also a huge fan of The Expanse. Also just a huge fan of detectives on other planets. So I'm here for this conversation. (laughs) That's what this is. That's what Jim is. He is a guy that always finds himself in the middle of, you know, life altering events or or history altering events. Um, in, In the first book, he changed in management. He was he gets caught up in a surveillance state, helps trying to take that down. And Rosetta. He helps, uh, gosh, how do I give, talk about it without giving it away? He goes to an asteroid and helps it helps save the world that way. I'll put it that way. And uh, Wilderness of Mirrors, he goes to Venus to stop a war between the two superpowers. And in this latest one, um, he's going to discover life on Mars. Just a little thing like that. Uh, th- this should be a series. This sounds super cool. Your lips to God's ears, I'll tell you that. Well, I, I well yeah. It. You you live in California, can't you just lurk outside the Warner Brothers building or something? Or I got my <laughs> office is literally across the street from Warner Brothers. Really? So I, yes. Maybe yeah. I knew that. Maybe that's why I subconsciously yeah. took that studio. Right. Uh, Disney's right down the street from me too. So I, I whenever I drive by Disney, I just kind of look up at Walt's office and just be like, someday, mm, someday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's some, well. I wanted to. I went by because I wanted to see the DC Comics note, the DC oh, yeah, Comics, right. which is on Warner Brothers now, apparently. But alas, they don't just let any chump in a rental car <laughs> drive in. So you have to do the tour. Outside. What? You have to do the tour. The tour is amazing. Of Warner Brothers, but that won't yeah. get you in the DC. I mean, they've got exhibits and stuff. But So I was probably outside wherever you live. But uh, who knows? There's got to be some way. You've seen things become movie or tv projects what do you think is the key i mean i've had things option but nothing actually all the I way i think the key is being known to somebody i, I mean because mm-hmm. i in all practical purposes i'm actually in the i mean you could say i'm very loosely connected to the industry and nobody knows who i am um mm-hmm. but that doesn't even mean anything people can know who i am and it still doesn't mean anything um a very I, I think it's just comes down to luck and who, you know, I mean, that's just the way the world works. Mm-hmm. But the more you do, right. Yes. The longer you stick with it, the better the odds. Right. I mean, look how long, I mean, the Lord of the Rings was insanely popular and let look how long it took to get a live action film made. I should say. We're not going to talk about the seventies weird animation one. That doesn't yeah. Count. That was, that does uh, not doesn't count. They didn't even finish. The irony, of course, is that Ralph Bakshi made Wizards to prove he could do the Lord of the Rings, and it's way better than his Lord of the Rings. <laughs> the audition exceeded the uh, what he actually ended up with. Um, what What do you tell people when you bump into somebody that wants to write? I mean, you gave one very good piece of advice, but... How do you think people should deal with all the confusion out there about, do I want to be in this incredibly shrinking world of traditional publishing or do I want to publish it myself? Or I don't think I, I, you know what? I don't think it matters what I would say or what challenges awaits anybody that wants to write. If they, if they really want to write, they're going to write. Mm -hmm. They're not going to let things like odds or, or whether or not they're good or anything like that, stop them. They're just going to go home. They're going to pick up their idea and they're going to want to put it down on paper. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of how I feel about it. I feel like if you want to be a writer, you're a writer. Uh, so long as you're, you know, trying to put words down on the page. So if you're trying to plot something out, that's who mm-hmm. you are. It's already too late. You're there. 
<laughs> That's very true. Hey, KJ wants to know, who are your favorite authors? I think probably she likes your TV show, so now she <laughs> he picks. So now she wants to hear about your authors. Uh, well, I'm a very big Harry Dresden or Jim Butcher fan, which mm-hmm. is Harry Dresden. Stephen King, of course, is the is the master by which we all you know measure ourselves by. Um, other ones, you know, I I love the. This might be <laughs> shameful, but I really do like Clive Cussler Cussler stuff. Mm-hmm. I think he's fun. I think the the way he comes up with novels and the way he writes is is a lot of fun. Um, and then, of course, a guy named William Bernhardt. Yeah. I think you may have heard of that guy. No. But yeah, no, seriously. I mean, I was I was reading your books when I was in high school, too. So I, I think wow. what's I was reading. I read everybody, really, when it comes down to it. If it's got a good cover and I like the first couple pages, I'll probably pick it up. OK, with that answer, you've just guaranteed yourself a permanent spot on this podcast. <laughs> all right. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, right. Bill, if I may, I, I might do something I've never done so far, which is I actually have a question for oh, our guest for today, it. which is, are you familiar with the Thrilling Adventure Hour uh, group of comedians? They're they're out of L.A. They do like an old timey radio show, but like as improv. And it sounds very I've never I'm not personally familiar with it, but I think I've heard of it. Yeah. The only reason I want to bring that up is because they have a character called Sparks Nevada, who is a human like uh, old Western detective, but he's on Mars with like uh-huh. Martians. And ah. it's got a theme song and it's very hilarious. And it was what I thought of when I uh, you know, looked at your book as I was getting the PowerPoint ready today. Oh, cool. So you well, should check I'm it out. Check out. It's, what, what is it again there? It's the, it's called the thrilling adventure hour. Thrilling adventure. Okay. That's right. Yes. Okay. And Sparks cool. Nevada is the name of the detective. So well, it's sort of right. inspired by old, old time radio shows, right? Mm-hmm. But yes, in fact, very modern. You must have a robot somewhere in all those Martian books. Yeah. No, I don't do any robots. Yeah. That's no actually robot? a very anti-AI, anti-robot stuff. Uh-huh. I explain that in the book as as uh, there was a gigantic nuclear war between the two major powers, and that put a lot of like technology as like verboten um, that you're not allowed to have, and that's <laughs> like AI, robots, all that kind of stuff. So that way, I try to make it kind of like as old timey as possible while still being as a future setting. So like a Dune that's, situation. Yeah. I, that's a great way to put it. I didn't, yeah, that wasn't my intention, but yeah, that's a great way to put mm-hmm. it. Yes. Something to so, limit the technology of the time so it doesn't have to get too crazy. All right. James wants to know how many drafts does it take to complete your novel? Don't that say one. Depend. We're not buying it. I mean, I, I mean, that's that, it, that can really depend on the novel and how much I really feel like it needs work. Cause like mm-hmm. I said, most of my rewrites go, it, most of my writing happens with rewriting. Um, I could look at a, I could look at a first draft and then go over it 14 times and that would be, that would be average. I would think. Yeah, me before too. Before I start really thinking like, okay, maybe this is ready for me to hit the save and publish button. I find it harder and harder to answer that question because I never print out drafts anymore. I used yeah. to, but now I just edit and edit and there are always like three hardcore revisions before I think it even looks like a book. But after that, I might work over here and work over there. And I'm not necessarily going in order and counting drafts is harder. And that's, and that's true. You know, what really true has spoiled me as well is that since most of my stuff is done on Amazon self-publishing, I can upgrade those drafts whenever I want. Well, and each of these novels right? is, yeah, each of these novels has gone through at least two revisions since I published them originally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, on, in one way of looking at it, they're never really done, honestly. Right. Yeah. Okay, another question. Tell us more about your writer's club. Oh, the writer's club in high school. Yes. Oh. I, it, was, it, was very, it was just a high, it was a high school after school club. Um, my mm-hmm. teacher, Mr. Harrison, he hosted us. It was me and a talented group of people. Uh, two have gone on to do writing type things. Lisa Graff. I don't think that's the name she writes under. So I don't know if I just doxed her or not. I hope not. But Lisa, mm-hmm. she does children's books. And then another person in the um, in the group went on to do game writing or writing for games. So it w- what I think was really great about it was just how it was kind of one of those random bursts of energy of, you know, creative energy that comes together and everybody really had fun with each other. And then you know, went off to actually pursue what we wanted to do in high school. Okay. We even did a, uh, we did a, 
God, what, what would you call it? A, a vellum at the end of the year. We posted all of our stuff, really? sold it to people. Nice. And, yeah, it was cool. It was a really good experience. All right. Well, I think I need to wrap this down. We've been going 45 minutes and so, clearly I need to let Baxter out. He's the dog. Uh, <laughs> but let me get one more question. If you could write anything, forget market, forget uh, genre, publishability. If you could write anything, what would it be? Uh, there's two. One that, that I've always wanted to write is is about my adventures in corporate radio. I started yeah, off as a stunt be boy. Yeah, I started as a stunt boy in morning radio. So I was the guy doing all the crazy adventures and stunts in the oh, morning. Wow. Uh, like which jackass I, stuff, or what are we talking here? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, jackass stuff. It was. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff I can't even repeat on here because I don't think your audience is ready for the kinds of things I was doing, but it was jackass stunts. We'll believe it in that. And then the other one, just not writing to market, but I've always wanted to write an adaptation of um, the Odyssey that's set in space. I've always thought that would really translate very well. That's a great idea. I love that. Yeah. I've wanted to do that for a long time, but I haven't really ever nailed the outline or the characters or anything yet, but it's always been one of those ideas. that's kind of percolating in the back of my head. Well, that's a great idea. And you're a great writer. And thanks so Thank much you. for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. I've had a blast. Thank you so much. Right. See you in a couple of weeks at WriterCon. Looking forward to it. Wow. Did I mention WriterCon again? Hey, <laughs> don't forget to register for WriterCon. Labor Day weekend, September 3rd through 6th. Website is writercon.org, and the app, which you can download free of charge, is WriterCon 2021. Let me also remind you that this podcast is ad-free. We're supported by our patrons. I've got a patronage site on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. That's patreon.com forward slash Wilburn, W-I-L-L-B-E-R-N, where you can support this podcast, or for that matter, I also do some writer mentoring through that site. So if you're looking for some help with your writing career, please check it out. Rate or review this show wherever you get podcasts. It does make it easier for other writers like you to find us. Until next time, remember, keep writing. You cannot fail if you refuse to quit. See you next time.